the 30th of September, 2004, in the El Amel neighborhood of Baghdad in Iraq, five seasoned, hard-looking men moved down the street. It was a very difficult time in that part of the city. They moved into an abandoned house. And inside, there was still some furniture, broken glass, and things like that. And they met three other men. They began to discuss an operation. They were soldiers. They began to discuss an operation that would be conducted. This was a difficult part of the war. Those individuals knew war. They made plans to conduct an operation that would be both dangerous for them and require very, very careful planning. Ultimately, because of the nature of the operation, they wore local garb, and they used local vehicles. And they had two vehicles, and then they had some people who would move on foot. When they were prepared, they occupied two of the vehicles, and then the people on foot took off. And they moved toward their target where their enemy was meeting. The enemy was meeting at the opening of a water sewage plant. As the individuals came, the first vehicle carried the first group of fighters to move to the target area. It moved right into the crowd, and then with a click of a switch, the car exploded. It created mayhem. But the, but the crowd began to gather back in again. The crowd had been Iraqi officials, American soldiers handing out candy to young children, and a disproportionate young number of Iraqi children. When the crowd had filled back in again, the second car arrived, and it too detonated. 42 human beings were killed, 35 of whom were children. 141 people were wounded, 72 of which were also children. And the sense of a military operation of the kind that we are not normally prepared for had to be gathered. Because this group of fighters were al-Qaeda in Iraq. They had become hardened professionals in a sense. And they'd conduct a very well-run operation with a new set of rules. So today I thought we'd talk about doing the right thing. But I'm not going to talk about it from a sense of morality. I'm going to talk about a sense of what this means for the future of organizational leadership. How things are happening in the real world and how I think that they will happen in the future. In 2003, I took command of the Joint Special Operations Command. That organization was known by its acronym, JSOC. I had served in it for much of my career. I would served in Afghanistan before this, and I took command of, its, of this unique organization. And this organization was formed after the failure of the 1980 attempt to rescue Americans held hostage in the American Embassy in Tehran. And it was designed to bring together America's most elite special operating units, Delta Force, SEALs, Rangers, others into this umbrella organization or task force that could do all the difficult missions that the nation envisioned we would need in the future. The failure of the Iranian rescue mission, Operation Eagle Claw, gave impetus. And fairly quickly, the resourcing and talent gave real strength to this command, real ability. So when I took command in the fall of 2003 in Iraq. By 2004, if I were to describe JSOC to you, it was a pretty unique entity. It was elite. Every individual in the organization went through a selection and assessment process, selection to get, a, to get selected, then a very detailed training process. It was well-resourced extraordinarily so, better than any other part of the U.S. military. In fact, if you had an idea of a new piece of equipment or requirement or weapon, we had the ability to fund and get that on very, very rapid timelines. And it was efficient. 
It had developed processes. It had developed a culture of doing things very, very well. So it was this very effective, unique entity. By the summer of 2004, we were also losing. And you say, what does losing mean? It's not like not making a profit this quarter. It doesn't feel like that. It feels and looks much different than that. It feels like tragedy. It feels like loss of life. It feels like loss of national and individual futures and dreams. And it, it requires people to come to grip with the fact you can lose, and you have to do something about it. We knew that something was different in this particular fight. We were so good, but we knew that the environment was different. The 21st century was different than what we had prepared for and what we had experienced earlier in our careers and needed something new, but we didn't know what it was. We just knew we were doing all the other things we'd been taught to do, but they weren't working like they used to work. But things change. Things change a lot for each of us and change in the environment, we got to recognize, admit it, and deal with it. But what are you affecting? You're affecting what we called the elegant solution. This is what was taught in business schools for many, many years. The elegant solution was great. I mean, just look at it. It looks good. Put that on the wall of your office. Looks like you know what's going on. Information goes down, goes through set paths. After a certain period of time, at the end of the day, end of the week, end of the month, whatever you specify, the information comes back up. There are right angles. There are blocks that fit neatly. And different parts of the organization, if they need to communicate, there's a process to do that. It's going to go this way. You're going to talk to this. And it's going to happen just like this. You know, it was designed, the Elegant Solution was designed to create order, to solve a problem, to create efficiency. It's so neat. It's so clean. It's so comfortable. What could be bad about this, or what could be the weakness? Because it was vertically stratified into horizontal tiers, tiers of rank or authority. It was horizontally stratified into vertical silos, typically around a functional area, part of an organization. And if you think of the horizontal tiering, information would go down. And it would go up, but it assumed that the organization had adequate time for information to flow through those pathways. But as tight coupling kicks in and increases in its reality, suddenly, if you've got to do business in one part of the organization, but it doesn't reside only in your silo, if it affects many other parts of the organization, suddenly you've got problems. Because across the organization, the pathways to connect these parts and deal with the tight coupling are ponderous. So what did we need? That was really what we faced. What did we need in Iraq? First off, as I talked about, JSOC was tasked with defeating al-Qaeda in Iraq, which we called AQI. And go back and look at what was the force I had. It was an extraordinarily elite, effective force, conventionally organized. It had some really important traits. It had a very clear and effective structure. It had very understood and rehearsed processes. It could measure what it did, and it could optimize or get the most efficiency out of the organization possible. Hit the most number of targets, do it with the right kinds of people. And so efficiency, the most effective executors, should have been dominant. Against this, we have al-Qaeda in Iraq. They were not organized like we were. They were organized like this loose network of associations. We kept trying to put them on whiteboards, and we'd map out their structure top and tiers down. But they never got that memo. And they were instead organized by friendships and family associations and who'd served together in Afghanistan, who had other relationships, who was married to whose sister. I don't think this was carefully thought out and planned, but it became the organic way in which they were structured. And what it gave them was extraordinary adaptability because they didn't have a manual that they were violating. 
Their manual was survive and win. And so suddenly this extraordinary, the apogee of efficiency is up against this child of adaptability, and we were having big problems. So adaptability becomes the holy grail. And the way I put that is adaptability is a difference between doing things right, doing things by established processes, habits, training, and doing the right thing, doing what works, becomes your attention. And if you go back to Iraq, the difference between my force and al-Qaeda in Iraq, as much as we tried, we carried the baggage of doing things right. If you don't violate your processes, the principles you've been taught, people won't criticize you even if you fail. But I did all the right things. No. If you lost, you obviously didn't. Against an enemy whose only metric was survival and success. So efficiency comes up against adaptability, and efficiency comes up the loser. So what we did was we melded the two. We tried to take the best of what we do, put it together with extreme adaptability, and change the way we thought and operated to make it work. So how did we do that? What did it look and feel like? So what does make a team great? We always say, well, go get the best people you can, some of its parts. Get together talent, and you're going to win. I call that the dream team fallacy. For those of you who remember the, Amer the U.S. men's basketball team in 2004, brought together the best professional basketball players in the world, walked away with a bronze medal, while Argentina got the gold. So strictly speaking, just talent doesn't do it. A team is not the sum of its parts. But if you think of Navy SEALs, you say, why are SEALs so effective? It's because they are all genetically superior, brilliant, motivated, etc. But in reality, to be a SEAL, it's difficult, but there are many people who can do it. So it's not a case of supermen. It's not a case of people who just are identified for their exquisite abilities. It's something else. And I think part of it is trust and purpose. Now, what is trust? Trust is, we use the term a lot, but I'm not sure we really know what it is. It's faith in your colleagues, but it's also familiarity with them. It's that special relationship that comes between people in organizations where you absolutely know and can rely on what they're going to do and why. And it builds that special bond. And so really, trust and purpose changes the basic calculus between individuals. So trust and purpose is an emotional linkage. Then you give them a contextual linkage, i.e., they have shared information. They all can get access to shared information. Suddenly, you get something that we call shared consciousness. Now, that shared consciousness is almost a magical property because people who have trust and purpose and then they understand and see similarly, not agree with everything, that's not the point, but it produces this emergent intelligence and awareness that is shared between them. When you think of effective intellectual synchronization, we think of NASA. And so what do you think? You think of the movie Apollo 13, and you think of the control room, and you think of failure is not an option, everybody going check, 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 check. The real miracle of NASA didn't occur in the Apollo 13 control room. It occurred in the development of the Apollo program, which was amazing. What they were doing in less than a decade was creating technology, all of which was changing as they did it, pulling pieces of all this technology together to create something that was extraordinarily different from anything that had been done. And they pulled this engineering effort together at disparate locations in real time, in less than a decade. It's probably one of the best case studies of an organization being able to share information. And remember, this is before they were empowered with as many information sharing tools as we have now. In Joint Special Operations Command, when I took over, we had a very small update every day for leaders in the organization. So we kind of get in a huddle and 
pass information synchronized. We started with about 50 people in it. By the time up, I gave up command, it was more than 7,000. We did it every day, 90 minutes long every day, essentially the whole command. So everybody shared information, knew where we were going, what we're doing, and what updates and changes had occurred. So you need some kind of robust communication form. Doesn't all look the same, but there's got to be a way where everybody develops that shared consciousness. And you've got to be emotionally tied because people act on emotion. We were running operations that depended upon aircraft who did surveillance, did full motion video. And we had fighters, shooters, our operators who were going to go on the targets. As much as possible, I brought all of those to single base locations because what I wanted is I wanted the pilot who was going to fly that very sensitive reconnaissance mission during the attack. When they came back and they went to the mess hall, I wanted them to run into the operators who'd been on the mission. And I wanted them to feel shared. And if one of them had screwed it up, I wanted them to see each other eyeball to eyeball because it's a lot easier to screw somebody that you don't have to see the next day. What did it do for us? How was it played back to me? In the summer of 2008, August 2008, my force in Iraq did 18 raids. That's about one every other night. Now, I thought we were at a breakneck pace. I thought we were just pedal to the metal. How could you do more operations than one every other night? Because they were planned, and they were rehearsed, and they were reported up to me, and then I'd approve them, and then they'd do them. Just couldn't do it. But we were still losing. And not only were we losing, we were starting to lose even more. So we changed how we operated, and two years later, we were in the fight the whole time there, two years later, same month, same force, same everything else, we did 300 raids that month, 10 a night. We kept that pace up for two and a half years. You couldn't have done that in a traditional hierarchical model. So when you think about inverting the model, really the two things that became critical. First, were shared consciousness. We've talked about letting people have a clear, shared understanding. And then the idea that you're going to empower execution. And the two support each other. They're mutually reinforcing. The battlefield, the environment, whatever you want to call it, has changed. And now, I believe, the secret is adaptability. And it's being able to increase our adaptability constantly. Not just our personal adaptability, but at every level.